wanted to welcome you to our, our brave new format. Uh, fun to see so many names of folks that I uh, recognize uh, from uh, uh, Abby and Andrew at the top to Zeb uh, who is logged in. Uh, a to Z, we've got everybody, uh, a lot of good friends uh, participating uh, in this program. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Droke. I'm here with one of my favorite uh, partners, Jessica Lenahan, who's a partner in our labor and employment uh, group in the Southern California office. And a uh, little bit about uh, uh, my own background about Dorsey & Whitney for those who aren't familiar with the firm. Uh, I'm a senior partner in the labor and employment and also agriculture co-op industry uh, practice groups. Uh, I've been at uh, Dorsey & Whitney since 1999, uh, since shortly at the very tail end of the last millennium. Um, Dorsey is a, a global law firm with 19 offices, including Washington, California, uh, two different offices in California, New York, uh, Canada, London, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and many uh, of our offices have employment lawyers such as myself and Jessica as well. Uh, I'm a, a member of our labor and employment practice, which typically represents the corporations and companies uh, working with HR professionals and in-house employment counsel in issues that range across the United States. Uh, myself, I'm a former human resource management professional. Uh, I've also been an operations uh, manager, practice head, uh, office head of hard lawyers, and I've been a lawyer for about uh, 25 years almost. I'm uh, licensed to practice in both California and Washington, and I've handled uh, issues ar around the globe. And <clears throat> the uh, presentation format that we'll be talking about uh, here today is uh, intended to be following up on uh, the uh, concept that we've had in our labor group for a long time, which is to try to be really practical and focus on issues that uh, people find important and uh, that help them design risk management programs that fit for their organization. And what we found is that most programs are in a talking heads format where uh, essentially it's like an in-person seminar, uh, but uh, with uh, a lot of data crammed into to the internet format. Uh, we have those two occasionally, but, but this program series is intended to be more of a conversation or an interactive dialogue, if you will, on a, on a particular topic. Um, the reason being that we find that most lawyer presentations and webinars frankly, are really boring, um, and they don't give us a chance to illustrate what clients tell us they love about working with us, us which is that we're real people, or at least uh, as real as lawyers can be. So in any event, uh, we're going to be talking about some uh, issues here. Not uh, as you, Those who participated in earlier versions of the interactive dialogue know we've taken on other issues that are really cross-practice areas. So, for example, in the last uh, presentation, we talked about uh, the intellectual property issues in employment law is kind of a crossover topic. This, we're, what we're doing is we're looking at a geographic talk, uh, crossover and uh, tackling issues of the top things that folks th uh, who have employees that are uh, working in California need to know about the peculiarities of California employment law. And for that, we bring in Jessica Linehan. Uh, Jessica, as I mentioned, is one of uh, my favorite colleagues in the firm. She's uh, just a great lawyer and great person. Uh, Jessica, do you want to give us a little bit of uh, your own background in employment law? Yeah. Um, I am a partner in the Southern California office of Dorsey & Whitney, focusing my practice entirely on employment law. And, well, it kind of splits right down the middle between advising companies on complying with California law and litigating employment issues. The bulk of the litigation that I do is is really California specific um, with a, a deep look at the California statutes, some of which we're going to talk about today, um, and, and the California protections for employees. So um, when you think about em employment law, it's sort of a micro look at California specific issues with, with my practice. So the question we ask uh, first is why pick this particular topic? Um, and, and I'll start by, by my own um, explanation. I find it fascinating how, how few companies I work with have zero employees in the state of California. Uh, it's often the case that you have a headquarters somewhere else, uh, but uh, a, at least one or two or sometimes a lot more than that employees in, in California. And so the issues that confront California employers also confront many of my, my clients, even if they have just a small number of uh, employees in the state. 
Uh, Jessica, why why is this topic impactful from your perspective? Well, I, I think it, it's similar to your experience. Even even where a company is not headquartered in California and therefore might not um, be generating policies with California in mind first, there's there's always going to be you know, more often than not there's going to be an employee. Uh, that sits in California, even if it's just the lone salesperson. And it requires a look, you know, even if you have just a handful of employees, it requires compliance with California's law, which can be tricky when you put so much time and effort into drafting policies, which may be drafted first and foremost with a, a, you know, being compliant, trying to be compliant nationwide. Um, So it requires just a second layer of effort to make sure you're in line with California. Now, we, we designed this as a top ten list. What did you do to go about uh, picking your, your top ten? Well, you know, just mostly thinking back uh, through two things um, in terms of in litigating cases, what are the most common claims that come across my desk? And there there really does seem to be claims that we see with far greater frequency, um, and those are included here. And a handful of them are some of the new laws that are giving employers a bit of a headache, or at least requiring employers to, across the board, take a look at policies and making sure that, you know, do we need to change something here in light of some new requirements that took effect either 2015 or 2016. You, you know, it's it's an interesting observation that um, a lot of times you will go to programs that are really a le- employment law update, uh, which is based on the cases that go to the appellate courts and, and decisions are issued. Uh, but often there's a really significant lag time between when those di- those legal issues first start getting uh, filed, the lawsuits and the like uh, are, are, are uh, filed and issues raised, and then down the road, a, uh, a a case is actually issued. In California, do you, do you have a sense about the typical gap between if a case is filed today and it goes on and the decision is raised and then uh, a, a, an appeal is filed, when would the a- appeal decision typically get issued? I mean, from, from filing to appeal, I mean, you're probably looking at two, two to three years. So there is, you're right, there is a lag time, and during that lag time, there's going to be employers on the ground that are in a little bit of limbo in making sure that you know, they want to comply, and there may be a case out there that leaves it up into the air, you know, some clarity on how to comply with certain laws. So, so what we're trying to do here then is to identify what are those issues that are germinating now, uh, haven't maybe kind of borne fruit uh, in uh, the uh, appellate courts, but are the things that people should be worrying out about if they have uh, employees on the ground in California, right? Exactly. Now, <clears throat> did you uh, come up with every one of the of the uh, ten, or was one of them mine? One of them was yours, and uh, and yours takes the number one spot. Since there you're we go, th- pole position. I like it. Uh, so so it. it an interesting issue and somewhat of cultural, and I'll explain why this is really largely for folks that are practicing outside of California and uh, trying to figure out how to analyze risks and issues in California. I typically have a way of thinking about uh, risk where I look at what are the percentage chances that I'm wrong, and then what's the percentage chance that I'm caught, and then I look at what is the likely damages. And the, when you look at that calculation for some jurisdictions, the chances that you're wrong are lower than in California sometimes because it's not quite as regulated a state. So, for example, if you're in Nevada or Arizona, you have different laws that – you have federal law, of course, that applies, and then different state laws, but not nearly the level of um, – of uh, regulatory influence that exists in California. And then the second thing is, what are the chances that you get caught? And at least in California, I started practicing in 1992, and I I remember distinctly when I was working in the Silicon Valley at that time. uh, This was kind of the Silicon Valley before it was the Silicon Valley. Um, But in any event, um, I used to be able to say to somebody uh, opposing counsel, you know, hey, you don't want to file this lawsuit because your uh, client will not want to have a lawsuit on their record and be seen as somebody who 
is uh, has a, a propensity to sue their co- their employers. And what I've found over the course of that time is that it is a complete reversal. Uh, that uh, in fact, uh, not only does that carry no weight in some cases, uh, the employee wants to be the one who filed the lawsuit. Uh, there's a, a lot of um, advertisement by way of uh, newspaper articles, social media, uh, and the like about jury verdicts, and there's a perception that uh, the jury verdicts are high and ought to be high. The other interesting implication in California is that it does allow for punitive damages and often uncapped uh, emotional distress and uncapped punitive damages in many circumstances, and so the potential for damages can be a whole lot higher. And so what that means is that both the employees who might want to file a lawsuit and also the jury pools that are analyzing the facts often have much higher expectations in California. So, for example, in Washington, where I primarily practice, if you take a case to a jury verdict and uh, there's an, a, a gar- what we call garden variety emotional distress, so y- you know, the person had emotional distress but did not seek psychiatric care and the like, it's, it's common to have a jury verdict in the twenty-five to maybe $50,000 range. Would that seem high or low to you in California, Jessica? It would not seem high to me. Um, I think I think if if you're looking at a if there's a claim that the plaintiff is looks like they're going to win, I would expect the emotional distress damages to be upward of that. Um, I do think it is I do think it is higher, and I think something you said before is very important. There's just not the caps in California that exist. Um, under certain federal laws and in other states, it's you know for to purposes of punitive damages and the emotional distress damages, it's a blank check for the jury to write. So when you're looking at the California risk, I think you have to factor in that as compared to other jurisdictions, it, you're less likely to take a chance uh, on having something that might be a technical problem, but uh, without a whole lot of damage associated with it. Uh, at where in other jurisdictions you might be willing to take take that risk. In California, you're much more likely to want to remain in technical compliance, at least from my observation in particular over the course of my 25 years doing this stuff. Well, Mike, over that period of time, have you noticed an increase in the jury awards or an increase in settlement amounts in your common employment claims? Absolutely. Um, you know, there have been so many changes in that time period. Um, obviously, inflation causes some of it, but even factoring that into uh, the uh, jury verdicts and awards, we see a substantial increase. I, I would gauge at least on the neighborhood of three to four times what you might see in other jurisdictions because the laws are more complicated. You're more likely to have a technical violation. There, there is that uh, impact for punitive damages. And, uh, and also, as I, as I mentioned, um, what's considered quote-unquote reasonable it varies a lot based on the culture of that uh, business community and, and employee population, and we've seen that really go north over the years. So it's important to stay in technical compliance, and one of the newer issues that we've seen, and, and our number two thing to be aware of is sick leave. Uh, Jessica, I I know a lot of employers, in fact, most employers offer some version of PTO, uh, which usually encompasses some sick time. Are there special rules in California? There are special rules. Uh, California is now one of the states that requires some amount of paid sick time. And although the statute focuses on sick time, it can, you know, having PTO does cover the requirement, you know, obviously, of, of giving sick time. And the statute does a couple things. It spells out how much sick time, you know, what the minimum sick time that the employer needs to provide to employees is. And you, while there's a few different ways of getting there, really at the end of the day what the statute wants to make sure is, is the employee getting at least 24 hours uh, or three days of, of sick time, of paid sick time, um, or 
PTO, as, as the case may be. Um, and there is some, you know, there is some technicality to the accrual system, so it is a very good practice just to, you know, even if you have an existing practice, to just compare it against the specifics of the statute, which I won't bore you with, but you know, the specifics of the statute to make sure that you're tagging the base from an accrual standpoint. Um, what, but what's I'm the, sorry. Uh, statute reference. How, if I were looking it up, what would I look for? Um, you would look for the California um, paid sick leave requirements, and you would want to look for two different concepts. You know, the concepts of accrual, um, and that's you know if you're going to give it over time, or uh, you're going to look at the concept of just awarding a lump sum, which it's under the labor code. It's and if you if you guys want to look it up, it's section 246 of of the labor code, um, but it, it allows for both methods. And so, and there's a couple of, of things that are interesting here. I mean, I think you're exactly right, Mike, that most employers already have something in place, and I think it's the rare employer that doesn't have some form of PTO or sick. But there are some that just provide only vacation, and so that needs to be addressed. That does not tag the base. But the other far more common dynamic that I see in in reviewing the policies, you know, as everybody was getting ready to comply with this and is you know in engaged in that ongoing process, it's more of a question of what can the employee use this time for? And it's very broad. You know, the employee can the employee can use it for their own or their family members, either you know, current medical need or preventative medical medical care in addition to a few other requirements under the statute. But, but even for employers, and I think this is probably the rule rather than the exception, even for employers that already have a policy, particularly with PTO policies, the policies have a lot of prerequisites built into the policy. I mean, for example, do, how much advance notice do I need to give before using PTO? Um, do I need to coordinate it with a manager in advance? Do I need to you know, work you know, for those sorts of restrictions where if you're going to be using that to satisfy the sick leave requirement, it's a different ballgame. If an employee is going to say, this is my sick time and I want to use it, they, be, you know, they have they don't have to give advance notice. They don't have to give a, you know, a reason. They just need to say, I'm using my sick time. And that's the area where we see the most needs where the policies, sort of, even though they're meeting the numerical requirements and giving a, a generous amount of sick time, the usage restrictions tend to be far more, you know, more stringent than what the statute allows. So it, it sounds like then if I am a company that has an employee in California and uh, then, then first of all, I should pull out Labor Code Section 246 and uh, check it to make sure that I at least have some uh, policy out there. And then even if I do have a PTO policy or other kind of thing that would give someone uh, vacation or sick leave, I should still be using that Labor Code section as a checklist to make sure that each of the elements are uh, – embodied somehow in, in our policy, otherwise I'd have to amend that policy at least for California employees. Is that fair? That's fair. And one other thing that I, I would do, in addition to working with the statute, which is, you know, the black and white, black and white requirements, the California um, California has a, a website on on the uh, Department of Industrial Relations page that has um, just some a very a far more user friendly checklist, and they update it with sort of with questions and answers, which I find to be like valid questions, questions that a lot of practitioners and HR people have about you know, how do we actually apply this law because it does have a few confusing elements to it. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Department of Industrial Relations webpage specific to the paid, um, the paid sick leave requirements. So the, the third thing that, that we listed was something called a, a PAGA. What in the heck is a PAGA and, and what do I do to avoid having one? Well, a PAGA is a claim under the California's Private Attorney General Act. And what it does, in essence, just to give you a little bit of background, there's a number of there were a number of statutes in the labor code. While they 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 were the law, they they imposed restrictions on employers or guidelines on employers. There wasn't a way for an employee to bring a lawsuit 
for a violation of those statutes, which was great for employers. I mean, it was a great defense to say, oh, you know, you can't sue me for that. Um, but what the PAGA does is it deputizes the employee to act as a private attorney general to bring claims on behalf of the state of California um, for a long laundry list of statutes. And, um, and in addition, you know, if the statute doesn't have its own penalty requirement, the PAGA imposes a separate scheme of penalties. So you know, in, in other words, it put far more arrows you know, in the hands of plaintiffs' attorneys in terms of their ability to bring claims and their so ability to collect penalties. Like I feel a little bit like being a kid again and opening up the Cracker Jack box and getting my little deputy sticker so I could be a you know a de deputy G-man or something. Is that what this in involves? Do, you get, do they need to actually get deputized? You know, there's no, uh, there's not a formal you know, process where they need to put on the, the deputy badge. Um, but what they do need to do, what the employee does need to do is they need to write a letter. They need to put the um, Labor and Workforce Development Agency, uh, which is the arm of the California state government that um, oversees this, and they need to let the company and the LWDA know sort of an advanced look at what they believe the violations are, referencing what the statutes are. And once, um, when that happens, there, that's sort of the, that is the flag that waves for the employer. And when you get when you get this letter, it it, it doesn't scream to you, you know, this is a lawsuit. It's not like getting served with, you know, um, a summons or the same you know, formality that normal happen normally happen. But this is a preview that there is a lawsuit a brewing somewhere. And the LWDA has the opportunity and that's the purpose of the letter. They have an opportunity to um, investigate it, but they rarely do. And so the, the LWDA will notify the, usually the employer and the employee that they're not going to investigate it. And that's the green light for the employee to then turn around and bring a lawsuit. So let me ask some questions about this part of the process, because this is the one chance you have to fix it and avoid having the PAGA claim. Uh, so first, is the letter that you're talking about something that would be like a, a demand letter or cease and desist that comes from a lawyer's office? Or is it something that has to come as authored by this uh, labor and workforce development agency? Well, it's the the first the first volley, if you will, comes from the employee uh, or his, his or her counsel to give notice to the LWDA and to the employer describing what the conduct is at issue, and then the ball is in the LWDA's court to decide. Um, whether or not they're going to investigate or not within a it's a, within a 33 day period. And so, uh, is that 33 day period the same opportunity you have to fix the problem? Yes, and you know, let's put the idea of fix in quotes. There are the LWDA divides up the statutes at issue um, within the PAGA into two into two buckets. There's the, there are certain claims that you, there are certain statutes in which you can attempt to cure the violation, and you can use that 33 days to fix it. There are certain claim statutes that you don't have you know, within the PAGA framework and oper the ability to cure it. Um, but that doesn't mean that if there truly is a violation going on, you can still cure it. It's just not a quote cure within the concept of the PAGA claim that would, you know, perhaps prevent the LWDA or the plaintiff from proceeding. And so one of the, for example, one of the curable claims that got a lot of attention in this past year is with respect to pay stubs. And you know, for those of you that don't know, California has some very specific requirements on pay stubs. It's sort of a laundry list of things that have to be there. And it's very, you know, somewhat ticky tack, you know, I mean, the, the very detailed. And so, so, so an example would be if if the top of the pay stub says Dorsey and Whitney, not Dorsey and Whitney LLP. Exactly. That potential violation. Exactly. And and there were plaintiffs that were bringing claims for uh, pay stub violations, and then uh, also t tagging on a PAGA claim because it was a you know their 
flagging this violation of a statute. Yeah. And so the PAGA was recently amended, you know, it was specific to wage statements, for example, to say, okay, you know, you, you have an ability to cure um, if you follow certain procedures to cure that violation um, in an effort to, you know, I mean, I think really to avoid some of the ridiculous results that, you know, a simple failure to add an LLP to a company name can spawn statutory violation with so, a PAGA violation tagged onto it. So let me understand, uh, just so I know, um, first some kind of answers to questions that I would have probably raised. First is, if I'm an HR manager or counsel, the question is how do you spot the issue? And the answer seems that you spot it in part uh, because you get copied on a letter to the LWDA, in which case um, the uh, um, you, you're on notice now <coughs> that uh, that they're seeking a PAGA damages, right? That's right. You're on notice that that there's a PAGA claim coming, and and I think that letter is is powerful for two reasons. One, because it's sort of it's the early smoke signals of a statutory claim. But second, you know that an employee has, to, you know, at the, in order for that letter to be generated, you know, in the real world, an, an employee would have had to sat down with a plaintiff's counsel, and they would have gone through that plaintiff's counsel's checklist of, you know, things we look forward to sue the company for. And so it may, you know, it may have a lot of aspects of, of a preview if, you know, if, if and when a lawsuit follows that letter what that lawsuit's going to look like. And so even if it's not something that would be specifically a PAGA violation, I mean, just to give a, you know, a complete detour, you know, maybe something like a breach of contract claim, it might still be referenced in that letter because the, empl the, the employee and his attorney is attempting to just get it all out there in the letter. So one of the things that I'm imagining uh, um, it could be a, a statutory violation and subject to a PAGA claim is uh, the – idea of equal pay for equal work. Uh, can you talk to that as our fourth issue? Yeah, yes. So, you know, in California, like under federal law, you know, there, there has been you know, longstanding protection of you know, equity and pay between uh, genders. Um, there's, there's been you know, a California statute in place for a number of years. But California um, added some amendments to its Fair Pay Act that really changed the balance um, and I think puts this concept a little bit into the forefront because of the changes that were made. Um, and in the, you know, in the simplest version, the California Fair Pay Act requires equity uh, in pay between, um, between the genders, between job roles. But what has changed is that, you know, whereas um, Whereas there was a really, before when you would look at this, it would be comparing a job position to another job, a comparable job position, you know, sort of title by title. Uh, but now the statute has been reworded to talk about, you know, requiring equity and pay for work that is substantially similar when viewed as a composite of skill, effort, and responsibility, and when okay. it's performed under similar working conditions. So when, you know, when you start hearing buzz... Like Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, when you start hearing those kind of buzzwords, that means no summary judgment, you get a trial. Right. I mean, those words to me sound like, you know, I mean, they should have just put, you know, this is a whole lot of gray area. I mean, really, it's, 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 you know, you, it used to have restrictions in terms of geography. You know, for example, if you and I are both employment partners, but we may work in different markets, and so there may be a difference in our pay. But under the new version of the California law, the geographic variable isn't an automatic explanation for a difference in pay. And when you think about, for example, California, I think like, like pretty much everywhere, if you have a, an employee that's based in a metro area, versus an employee that's based out in the boonies, there's often going to be a difference in pay. And that was, you're able to account for that by geography, uh, sort of out of the box. And that is, that is not, you know, that is not the first line of defense anymore under this statute. Um, the statute places the burden on employers, you know, if there's a claim to show that there is, um, that the pay differences are based on 
certain enlisted factors, and that's things like seniority, merit, um, you know, or other bona fide factors. Now, to be clear, something like geography could be a bona fide factor, um, but in the previous versions of the statute, it automatically accounted for um, geography. It automatically accounted for if somebody worked the night shift versus the day shift. You know, it's, I think you know, it's very common to get a nighttime premium. Those things have been written out of the statute. And unlike federal law, you know, the, the employee, you know, there, there isn't a need to prove that there was a discriminatory intent behind a difference in pay. Um, just the fact that the difference in pay exists is, is enough. So it looks like from your last bullet there, there's a lot of differences in litigation from how the burdens of proof have been allocated, right? Yeah, and you know, going back to the point that you made at the beginning, you know, we look at you know how long do things take to germinate? Claims under you know the prior version of the statute, it wasn't a you know it's it's I would say it's somewhat it was somewhat rare. The you know claims for equal pay you know on a, on the state level in California were not a hot burning litigation item, but we're in with this new law we're in we're in that point in time where. I think you know we're in that germination period that you referred to, where I think both the plaintiffs, bar, and defense counsel are looking at how is this going to go, and how does the fact that it's a much lower bar, a much lower threshold that an employee would have to meet, is that going to is that going to open the floodgates to claims? And we're at, we're at that point in time where it's not entirely clear, but you can see how the changes make it much easier to bring a claim. Yeah. So from a, a practical perspective, um, at least my clients, you know, I, I can't think of a single time where they've intentionally paid uh, somebody different based on gender, uh, uh, you know, up or down. But it sounds like the intent isn't relevant. So what's, uh, what's an employer to do? What are the practical steps you can take to get in compliance? Well, it's to, it's to audit. It's to conduct, you know, it's to audit the practices, but which I think most employers are already doing. But the twist here is to keep in mind that an audit that simply looks at, you know, for example, um, accountant level two, you know, where you have some sort of, you know, stratified position and you just compare accountant two to accountant two as some sort of level of employment, that's not necessarily enough. You need to step away from sort of those formalistic um, position requirement, you know, position definitions or titles, and think a little bit more broadly about are these employees working for? Are they doing similar work? Are they working under similar working conditions? And is the skill and effort substantially similar? So it requires a little. You lose some of the elegance of being able to do a position by position analysis, which of course you would continue to do. You would just need to open, you know, consider whether you need to add more um, positions to the analysis when comparing uh, roles. So, so the next uh, topic that you, you picked was reimbursements. Why pick that as a topic? Well, I'll tell you, you know, the real reason why I picked this, uh, we I recently did a, a, a presentation like this where we, I was a co-presenter with a very active, very popular plaintiff's attorney. Uh, and you know, I admit it was odd sharing the stage with you know, a rival. But I think the most interesting takeaway I had was this plaintiff's view of reimbursements. And in California, you know, I think reasonably enough, the labor code requires that the employer has to compensate the employee for necessary business expenses. But this, the plaintiff side view that I saw firsthand in this recent presentation I did, it went to—I mean, it went to the edges of ridiculousness. Uh, frankly, you know, it was a discussion of, just for example, okay, if an employee is required to work at home, you know, do we need to pay for the um, internet or a percentage of it? And you know, at that point, I'm thinking, okay, I mean, I guess it's. It's a tall order, but I suppose it's within the realm of reasonableness. Then they start to talk about, well, what about the electricity? You know, does he get to submit an electric bill, you know, a percentage of the electric bill because the employee had to work at home and the employer would have otherwise been paying for lights back at the home office? Um, so there's just this idea of, 
whenever a business expense is passed on to an employee, you know, does that theoretically fall within the realm of a potential claim for reimbursements? Uh, and or, plaintiff- or a portion of the, the Barco lounger when I'm sitting there working on my laptop. Exactly, exactly. This is a classic example of the first rule of employment law, which uh, folks know uh, is uh, that no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, by letting somebody work from home, uh, you you then incur these additional risks, essentially. Oh, yeah, and I mean, and, and speaking of, you know, in the universe of no good deed goes unpunished, there is a fascinating case that's out there that is not, yet, when I last checked, was not yet resolved. But it involved a group of employees that um, were assigned to work from home. I mean, that was their home office. Like the, I think the office didn't have space for them, and the position made sense for them to work remotely. But once it's a certain interval, you know, like once a quarter, the employees, or once a month, the employees would be required to drive into the home office for meetings. And the employees brought a claim saying we should be getting mileage reimbursement for that. We're leaving our primary place of business, our home, to go into the home office once a month, and so we want our $6 mileage reimbursement for that. And that was one of those examples where I thought, wow, that's, you know, I, they, may have, they may have a point. I mean, I'm interested to, interesting, interested to see how this case unfolds. But at the same time, I think, I think it's the rare employer that would think that, oh, you know, requiring somebody to come into the home office becomes a reimbursable expense. But in you California, know, anything can happen. It's, it's interesting uh, because it also tees up, of course, uh, topic number six, which is hours worked. And, you know, another question that could be asked in that situation is what, what would be considered compensable time for that employee who's being required to come in and have periodic check-in meetings? Right. And, and in California, what's considered, and, and it's important to always have in your mind, is that it, time spent you know, either where the employee is um, permitted to work or time spent under the control of the employer is compensable time worked. And so this definition does differ in, uh, in, in ways from the federal requirements. And it's a, I think it's one of the, one of the more vulnerable areas for uh, employers because there is you know, usually w- within the realm of preliminary work tasks or post-preliminary work tasks because there's always something that has to be done, you know, usually before you start work in many cases. So then the question becomes, should that time be on the clock or is it excluded? So t- tell me more about this idea of under the control of the employer. So you know, if I have a, a policy that says, you know, uh, don't commit a felony and somebody uh, therefore has to refrain themselves from committing felonies, does that mean that they're under, under my control? No, um, no. In that situation, they're free to commit to felonies, um, and your advice will not make you know that that lifetime compensable or not. But it's more of you know, one of the more I guess stark or dramatic examples that comes from California law was where there were employees that worked out in an agricultural site, and so it was a little bit far flung. So they had the employee, the employer had a meeting spot where everybody had to meet. And then they would get, they had to get in the company truck and drive out to the site. And then at the, at the work site, they then began work. And the employee said, yeah, that time that we're in that truck is compensable. And the employer said, well, no, that's your, that's part of your commute. You would have had to you know, drive to that specific work site in some way, shape or form. But the court said, no, they, you know, in that situation where they're you know, required to be in a certain place um, that's under the control of the employer and is therefore compensable time. And one of another so, example. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was going to pose another example. This one by Jesse Collings, who reminded me that uh, since I work in Seattle, which is a jurisdiction that requires employers to uh, interview and, and offer ex felons uh, jobs before determining whether or not they're going to refrain from hiring them. Uh, that maybe a better example would be you have an on-call worker who may or may not get called, you know, like an IT professional or something along those lines. 
but but you do say that you you have to refrain from uh, drinking alcohol or at least being under the influence of alcohol during the time period where you're on call. Would that render the on-call employee subject to the quote-unquote control of the employer for hours work purposes? That's a great question. And when I think, it, the answer is it depends. And when I think of this, I actually visualize in my mind one of those retractable leashes that dogs use, not to equate, um, not to equate you know, us with um, pets. But if you say to somebody, you, know, you need to be sober, you need to be able to get to the work site within 20 minutes, then that leash is very short. There's, you know, they're, they're, the employee doesn't have the freedom to you know, just kick up their heels and have three martinis. And so their time really isn't their own anymore within the view of California law. But if you say to somebody, you know, you, you're on call, uh, you need to be uh, where it's a little bit looser, where the, the reporting time requirement is a little bit looser, um, then in that situation they would not be under the control. But where the, where the restrictions are such that, that, they, that there are just too many limits on their time, then it, it, could be, it does become compensable time, especially, especially the reporting time. You know, the ability, the requirement that you, you know, be able to get to the work site or get to a customer site with an X, you know, some relatively low period of time is, is an is indicia that it's under the control of the employer. So, so one, one other participant asked um, a question about commuter benefits. And if an employer offers uh, some benefits to commuters for, for taking buses or, or alternate uh, transportation, uh, does that put them under the control for reimbursement purposes? No, no. I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen a case or a situation where the fact that the employer um, chooses an, or offers to subsidize it, where it converts it into um, time worked. And you know, maybe one example is, you know, if you if there's a van pool, you know, so I, I mean, so I guess to contrast it with the example I gave before, I mean, say there's a van pool, and so you've got this van of employees cruising together into work, um, it's still optional. Uh, so they, because that's optional, that you know, just because they're in a company van, for example, then that doesn't become compensable time worked. Whereas in the example of the agricultural workers, you know, they, they had to get on that truck and they had to um, take that route to the workplace. So no, that, that, that's a very interesting question. And, it, you, know, and it, you know, I guess I reserve the right to say that, you know, in some way it might, there may be the law of good, good deed goes unpunished lurking in there, but I'm not aware of it yet. So the next uh, wage and hour issue was exemptions, and can you talk a little bit about the difference between California exemptions and the white collar exemptions in, under federal law or other jurisdictions? Sure. Yeah, I think you know, I think what I want to hit on really, I think the most important point is that California just looks at the numbers quite a bit more. I mean, there's the it's tethered to the minimum wage, so that does it's a bit of a moving target in terms of year over year, what, you know, what's the threshold that the employee must hit. But more importantly, the, the law really focuses on what is the employee actually doing it and what is the quantity of time that they're doing it for. And it needs to be um, the exempt duties need to be more than half of that employee's time. And so it's not just a matter of tagging the base of, you know, hey, this employee has might be the, it might be the heart of their job to do these exempt tasks. That's really why we're hiring them. Yet there's uh, enough non-exempt duties. You know, in California, if there's too many non-exempt duties, it'll push it right back into an, a non-exempt status. And I see this as most problematic where you think about the dynamic of a workplace where if you have a position that fails the exemption test in California, it does create a bit of awkwardness. And within within an organization where everybody else is exempt, and then you've got you know, you've got Mike in California who's being paid on an hourly basis, and so it creates you know it's it's a little bit cumbersome from an administrative standpoint, but it's important. And I think so it, what, um, do, what do employers do to manage their risk in this situation? Well, same same as with the fair pay. I mean, you you want to audit, but you want to audit 
not just the job. A, a beautiful job description is it you know, makes everybody happy, right? I mean, of course you want to audit the job description and have a nice job description and have the job description be consistent with an exempt role. Um, and you want to have the performance reviews be consistent with reviewing the exempt duties and focusing on um, the exempt nature. But when you do the audit, if there was a, you should you should always remember that if there's a lawsuit, they're going to get into the weeds of what was this employee actually doing, and so your audit should acknowledge that and, and look at that as well because a paper audit will only get you so far. Um, because you know while if if you're forced to litigate an exemption issue, you know, of course your job description, your performance reviews might be Exhibit A and B in your defense. The plaintiff is going to be all over. What were they actually doing? You know, like looking at the emails, looking at um, looking at a performance review that focuses on the non-exempt tasks you know, disproportionately heavily, and so forth. So, so the so the next topic is is near and dear to my heart as um, somebody who practices around the the U.S. and in particular in two jurisdictions, uh, one of which Washington allows for non-competes and will actually reform overbroad non-competes to, to still enforce them partially. And then California, which swings the opposite side of the spectrum. What's California's uh, requirement? Well, in California, uh, restraints on an employee's ability to compete are against the public policy of the state and are void. And I have to say, non-competes are probably the biggest area where I feel as uh, as a an advisor to companies where I feel peer pressure, you know, where the where it's it's often a negotiation of, come on, can't we just put a little non-compete, just a little tiny one, you know, just something very minimal, um, and the answer is no, you know, don't do it, and for two reasons, you know, one because it's against the public policy of the state, but two, a lot of times you know, there's a temptation to say, well, why don't we just put a non-compete in there and then we just promise that we won't enforce it, but we just want to have it in there as a bit of a deterrent to the employee. In California, there's cases out there that say that that in and of itself is an unfair business practice under the Bus Business and Professions Code, which is um, sort of a, a very broad statute that allows you to um, sue for unfair, unlawful business practices, and th that would be one of them. So there, it's something that you want to avoid in your employment contracts with employees. Yeah, I saw a case filed in California uh, alleging that uh, a, an employee's refusal to accept a job offer that that required a non-compete was that 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 refusal was essentially akin to a, a termination in violation of public policy. That's right. Because of that very theory. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and I take it that answer is the same even if I had a, a agreement that incorporated Washington law, or how does how does that work? Well, California will California sort of wraps its arms around those people that work within the state. So even if I present a, um, you an employment agreement, and the person it, you're giving it to me, I work in California, and you but you specify Washington law as governing the agreement, California courts will tend to disregard that. Um, I think so the one angle, you know, the small pathway that, that some companies attempt to pursue, uh, and it hasn't really, you know, it's, it hasn't been extensively litigated, but, you know, what do you do if you have a, if you require, in our example, Washington to be the exclusive venue for litigating, and you put Washington as the um, as the law governing that agreement. In, in that situation, the employer might have a shot of running into the Washington court, you know, suing in Washington, mm -hmm. alleging Washington law. And some um, some companies have been successful in doing that. Um, but there's a bit of you know there's always a bit of a race to the court element there. You know, if the employer went to California law first and said, hey, you know. This is this is still a California issue. There are no guarantees to the employer so, in that situation. Speaking of racing to the court, and with uh, eight minutes to go here, we've got two more topics. And the next one is uh, break time. Uh, why did you identify break time as one of the top ten things that employers should be thinking about in California? Well, you don't think 
break times are still, believe it or not, often left out of policies. Um, I, I think that's always an area where um, the policies can, you know, more often than not, can be strengthened and can be, you know, you want to have it on paper, black and white, that you're that you're making the breaks available to the employee, especially in a, in a post-brinker world, right, where the California Supreme Court says that we need to make uh, uninterrupted meal and rest periods available to employees. And so having a very nice policy that says, you know, thou shall take the break and you need to take the rest period are very helpful. And so it's, it's unfortunate when we, you know, we get into litigation and a lot of times this involves, you know, the, an employer with just, you know, the handful of California employees, there's not always that rest period spilled out, uh, spelled out in, in the requirement. And as you know, in now, California, you, oh, go ahead. You, you, you'd mentioned uh, Brinker. Um, what, what is that briefly? Well, Brinker is a law that clarifies, you know, the question that had been burning for so long. You know, do we have to force people, and you know, do we have to escort people out the door to make sure that they um, take their meal and rest periods? Um, and rather, you know, the court came down and said, you know, we need to make uninterrupted meal periods and rest periods available to employees in which they're relieved of all duties. Um, and so it's the, the thought of making it available to them. And a, and a big piece of that is, you know, are they being relieved of all duties? And um, because if the employee's not, there's, there's a penalty. You know, for if, if the employee is not given the opportunity to take a full un uninterrupted meal break, there's a one-hour penalty um, for missing, you know, for not having the opportunity to take a meal break or a rest break. And so it can add up, and it can, and you know, not having the penalty, as you can imagine, can create a cascading series of problems. One, because you've got the one-hour uh, pay penalty. If you don't pay it, then the pay stub is wrong. And if you don't pay it and the employee leaves, then the final paycheck is wrong. So you can see this as sort of never-ending sequence. Um, by not doing that. And the California courts, you know, speaking of perfect policies, there was, there was a recent case in California where uh, the employer had a beautiful policy. It was great. It was fantastic. But they never once paid a meal penalty for some, and, they, and the court said, you know, you're great, but we find it hard to believe that nobody ever, ever didn't, you know, take a meal break. Yeah, missed their meal break, yeah. And so the fact that it was never paid, it created a foothold for a class. Or they said that this wow. could give rise to a class because you have this policy, um, but also this uniform practice of not paying for the penalties. And just and just to touch on the idea of it being an uninterrupted break, there is um, a lot of times there. Uh, if you think about an employee that carries a walkie-talkie, or a pager of some sort, and you know that thing may be going off all day long, but the employee knows they're on break. Uh, but the question has arose, well, you know, but does, what does that mean? You know, if the, if the employee might um, feel compelled to have to respond to a call um, or, or, you know, respond to a page, you know, does that mean that they are, that they have a, um, that they don't have an interrupted meal break? But to go back to the question before about on-call employees, in that situation, it just just by virtue of you know sort of being on call doesn't make doesn't convert the meal period into a working meal period but if the employee actually then starts working then you want to be really sure that you have a mechanism in place for that employee to report the fact that they worked um now and a quick a quick question before and then we have to move to the other slide is does the meal and break time uh, requirement apply to exempt employees or just to hourly folk? Uh, it, it applies only to uh, the hourly employees. Um, it doesn't apply Great. to exempt workers, just with the small, tiny exception that in California there's a special exemption for your commissioned uh, inside commission sales folks that, you know, where they're making more than 50% of their pay on commission. For the inside commission worker, they, while you're exempt from overtime, there still is a requirement that they get meal periods. So a little bit of a, a quirk in the law that I just want to flag. So, so our last in trying to have 10 legal issues uh, uh, that could be their own presentation but do it in one um, is leaves of absence, uh, which uh, I've literally had half-day programs uh, on. 
Can you briefly summarize the differences between California law and what people might expect under federal law? Sure. I mean, just to, just to hit uh, on, on a few points, um, you know, there are differences just, you know, even at the issue of, you know, what is a disability under the FEHA and under the ADA. But one of the more common ones where I think, you know, you know, we see so many disability claims, but in California, the disability claim never stands alone. It, there's always a tag-along claim for failure to um, engage in the interactive process and failure to request, um, to failure to provide reasonable accommodation. But why, I want, but why it was important, I thought, to flag it here is it's that it create, there's a situation where, you know, where the, at the end of the day, um, you, you know, maybe the accommodation issue is dealt with. You determine that there's just no accommodation or there's clearly no accommodation or the employee's accommodated. But, there's a, the, but the interactive process is a standalone obligation and it's a standalone claim and an employee can prevail on a claim saying, hey, the employer did not engage in an adequate good faith and interactive process, even if you know, they can't, you know, even if they're not going to win on, a, on an accommodation claim. So there are different roads to victory for an employee here with a disability. So I just wanted to flag that for everybody, that the, that the dance that you're required to do with the employee is um, it's an ongoing obligation. You know, it's interesting, of course, uh, employment uh, lawyers and experienced HR professionals know the interactive dialogue, which is the title of this series, is a defined term in our world. It's the interactive process that is described on this slide. And I guess the takeaway for me of leaves of absence in California uh, is that, uh, no surprise, there are uh, various legal theories that might apply and a, and, a, and a bit of a maze to work your way through, um, but also that it's important to engage in a good faith interactive process with the employee who's requested an accommodation, even if you're pretty sure there's no possible way to accommodate that particular condition. Because uh, even if there isn't likely to be a claim, a, a way to accommodate the uh, employees still might have a claim for failure to engage in the interactive process just standing all on its own. So with that, um, Jessica, do you have any kind of final thoughts? It's just that the, the issue spotting is is part of the is a key part of the job. You know, don't just because something works under federal law or another law, you know, use that as sort of a subject matter checklist to question: Does this work under California law? And is it enti is it entirely possible that you know what may be completely great under another state's law is not only unlawful in California, but could be the source of penalties or a separate claim. Um, so the, the issue spotting process is, is an ongoing exercise. So in particular in California then, uh, or for California employers, if you are an HR professional or employment counsel with uh, most of your experience outside of California, it sounds like there are two things. The first, you can't necessarily rely on the policy and apply it uh, because it's your policy. And second, don't necessarily trust your instincts because your instincts may be generated out of the federal law or the law of the jurisdiction you're working in, but they may not apply in California. Is that fair? That is perfect. So with that, a couple of uh, things. First of all, you're going to be uh, – all the presenter, all the um, participants will be getting – a, a evaluation form. We really encourage you to fill that out. We read them uh, carefully. Uh, one person, for example, in the chats um, recommended another topic for another program. We love hearing that. And also feedback on the general presentation format, whether you prefer having a whole bunch of very technical slides or if it's more interesting and informative to see the issues presented in this format. We love your feedback and really um, value that. You'll also have an opportunity to get either SPHR or uh, legal uh, continuing education credits uh, by submitting information to Michelle Hubble, which will all be explained in the evaluation form process. And of course, if you have any specific questions on California or really any employment law issue, you're, you're welcome and encouraged to contact either Jessica Linehan um, at the contact information here, 714-800-1428, uh, or myself at 206-903-8709. So thank you to all the participants. This concludes our program. Thank you, Jessica, for a very informative and interesting presentation. 
Thank you.